I'd like you to take, go back to Britain in the 18th century, to the beginning of the 18th century, where women who clothed and plenished their homes lived in a largely plain world. Wealthier women had access to more sophisticated pattern-woven silks produced on what were called flowered looms, and the city of Norwich in East Anglia was renowned throughout Britain and Europe for what they called Norwich stuffs, which were patterned woolen cloths. What was, not, what was generally not available was printed pattern on cloth. Now, this is something we're used to. We're, we're used to being able to go out and purchase blouses or dresses which are patterned, and I can see some in front of me. And we're used to going out and buying patterned cloth for our drapes and furnishings at home. But that not, was not the case in the 18th century. So women had to resort to using needlework techniques to enhance their plain fabric world. And of course, the 16th and 17th century saw the flowering of needlework in Britain. Needlework and embroidery skills were imposed into children from a very early age and continued to be practiced because there was an expectation they had to be skilled. And the embroidery skills were applied in professional workshops where both men and women supplied high status clothing and high status furnishing. And in domestic circumstances, the women embellished their cloth to give pattern and texture to use around the home. They often sourced their designs from pattern books or designs were supplied already marked on their fabric. Now, we all know quilting can be appreciated for its warmth giving property. But at this time, as much importance was given to the textural effect achieved from quilting, and it often was used in conjunction with embroidery. Um, as with these two examples here. Quilting might have provided warmth to these pieces, but the majority of the reason for the quilting be there was to provide pattern behind the embroidered motifs. <coughs> quilting was used in clothing too. And whilst I can see that women who wore this silk quilted petticoat on the left here would have appreciated the warming layer around her ankles, the quilting pattern on the petticoat was worn to be seen under a dress that had an opening in the front. Uh, a friend of mine owns this petticoat. Uh, she found it in a trunk of her mother's and thought it was just a piece of silk and was flabbergasted to hear that it was over 200 years old. But when I wanted to take a photograph of it, she insisted on wearing it. <laughs> Horrified, which is why you can see a hand. I've, I've cut the rest of her off because she was, uh, um, didn't have appropriate upper gear. <laughs> um, and this type of petticoat you see there was a standard petticoat that was sold off the peg. And women could go in and buy, depending on how tall or short they were, a certain left petticoat that would suit them. And they could adapt to the width they were because they tied at the side. And you could tie them tighter or looser depending on how wide you were. There were more sophisticated petticoats that could be made to commission, but this is one of the off-the-peg ones. On the right are baby's clothes, which are cord quilting, and that's two layers of cloth sewn together uh, with channels, and then the channels created with the sewing uh, are threaded through with cotton from the back to give you a texture. But obviously, it doesn't provide the warmth-giving layer that you see in normal wadded quilting. Of course, an excellent way of achieving pattern is to combine a variety of colored cloths in various shapes to make patchwork. And it's clear that it was made in this early 18th century time. I've called this talk like Gulliver's Clothes because Jonathan Swift in his book, Gulliver's Travels, published in 1726, said in his description of Gulliver's Clothes made by the tailors of Lilliput that they looked like the patchwork made by the ladies in England, only that mine were all of a colour. This demonstrates to me that patchwork was obviously such a common technique at the time that Swift knew his readers would understand what he meant. Also, the reports of trials of the Old Bailey Court in London record that in 1712, Mary Smith was accused by her former mistress of stealing a piece of patchwork. 
and she was only acquitted after she brought witness to say that they knew the patchwork and they helped to make it. In other words, this was a servant making patchwork. It's also recorded the pieces of fabric were sold for patchwork during this period. Mary Rich was found guilty at an Old Bailey trial in 1726 for stealing goods including 80 pieces of silk that were, quote, such as were used for patchwork. When I first became interested in quilt history in the 1830s by reading the classic textbooks available at the, t sorry, in the, se I'll try again. <laughs> when I first became interested in quilt history in the in 1980s, <laughs> by reading the classic text art textbooks at the time, I was aware there were some 18th century pieces of patchwork and quilting. But I'm afraid I was guilty for just accepting what the textbook said and not actually thinking about it further. But my life changed in 2000 when I visited a town auction room in a town called Banbury in Britain and viewed lying on top of a table, on top of old carpets and other bits of textile, surrounded by old plows, boxes of broken crockery, furniture in various stages of condition, was this piece of brightly colored silk pattern patchwork. And my seeing this in 2000 has really brought me here today. What I saw was this. This patchwork silk coverlet was subsequently bought by the Quilters Guild of the British Isles using all their acquisition fund. And it was just on my recommendation. I tr they trusted me, thankfully. And it's now held in the museum collection at St. Anthony's Hall, York. And the Quilt Museum and Gallery at St. Anthony's Hall, York is the only quilt dedicated quilt museum in Europe. And it opened two months after the centre opened here. So we've got parallel lives going on the other sides of the Atlantic. The difference is that this centre is an architect design, custom built centre dedicated to the most contemporary way of displaying quilts and researching quilts. And the Quilters Guild Museum is in a 15th century ancient guild hall with wood beams surrounding the exhibition space. But the quilts work well in both places. This coverlet measures 66 and a half inches by 73. And it's made of 182 patchwork blocks with geometric patterns as well as design showing figures, animals, and flowers. And can you see the tulip, uh, four cross tulips? And lots of little animals down there. And then lots of geometric blocks as well. The basic block size is four and a half inches square, and there's also some larger square and rectangular blocks. The design is set so it's symmetrical about a central vertical line, that is, the blocks match each other either side. What's sig most significant is a very badly worn block right above the center star with a date 1718 and the letters EH. This makes the coverlet the oldest known dated coverlet anywhere in the world. Now, can you see the figures of the man and the woman and the way the background behind them has been divided? So the man and the woman don't just sit on a plain background in the block. The colors have been altered behind the man and the woman. Now, I would like you to picture in your lap a square, four and a half inches, really not very big. I'd like you to imagine inserting into that four and a half inch uh, block the shapes needed to create the woman. There are 12 pieces that are needed to go into that lady block of four and a half inches square. Now I know many of you in the audience are quilters. To design a four and a half inch block, figurative block, you would reach for your wonder under or your freezer paper. <laughs> I can tell you that these blocks here and all the blocks in the coverlet were made with a patchwork technique called mosaic patchwork. Mosaic patchwork is sometimes called English paper piecing or piecing over papers. 
It is work by cutting paper shapes or templates. The fabric you wrap over, to these, over these templates and you take the seam allowance to the back. And then you baste through all the layers to hold the seam allowance against the paper and against the top. Once you've basted, wrapped and basted all your shapes, you then join but the, the shapes together and over sew them or whip stitch them together. Now, many of you will have seen hexagons repeating, the six-sided hexagon shape repeating uh, to create these designs. But what you may not have seen before is this mosaic patchwork technique applied to such complicated shapes where you've got to wrap the fabric over shapes which might be curved, convex and concave, which means you've got to have lots of manipulating of the fabric to get it wrapped over firmly and to actually get the back to lie flat. Now, added complication in these is that you can't see the basting stitches. And that's because the woman who made this decided not to have the basting stitches showing on the top. So in other words, she basted the seam allowance and the paper only and didn't bring her needle through to the top. So can you imagine your top surface, your paper, and your turning, and you've got to actually maneuver your needle so you don't catch the top surface. And the theory behind why she did that was either she didn't want to damage the silk with the basting thread, or she knew that she wanted to leave the papers in the piece when it was finished. So again, she didn't want the basting thread to show on the front. But I can tell you, it takes a lot of manipulating of the cloth to do that. And even with the convex and concave um, curves, you have to either gather the fabric at the back, or you have to click the seam turning at the back to get it to lie flat. And again, can you see added complication? The needlewoman has made her task even more difficult by dividing the background with the different colors diagonally. Now, in 2003, the coverlet was taken to be conserved at the Textile Conservation Center in Winchester, where the piece was smoothed out, the papers were flattened, and the entire top was covered with net. Now, during that process and during our research process before, we'd seen these tantalizing little pieces of evidence of the paper showing through the worn areas. And some of the papers had handwritten or printed text on them. And we really wanted to know more, but we couldn't see from the back because the back of the coverlet has been lined with linen right from when it was made. So the conservator involved with conserving the piece at the conservation center and a staff photographer developed a technique to photograph the paper through the silk without further damage to the silk. And they did it by uh, using a large code light source light box. And they constructed a cage frame on top uh, on runners. And they laid the coverlet on the cage frame with a camera suspended pointing downwards above. And they slowly moved the coverlet over the light box and laboriously took an image of every single 182 blocks in the piece. And from the photographs, you can see how the needlewoman wrapped the silk over the paper. So at the top, you have um, the block with a shamrock type shape. And that is the photograph it through the silks. And can you see how she's had to gather and pleat the seam turning around the curve? And down below here, this animal, she's clipped the seam turnings to get it to lie flat. So how did the maker construct the coverlet? The transmitted light photographs give us many clues. The designs from the blocks vary from geometric ones, bottom left, or figurative ones, bottom right. Now, the simple designs you could make by getting a piece of paper, a paper square and folding it in half and quarters, diagonally and horizontally. And can you see this photograph here? Pointer's not working. Can you see the fold line 
on the paper showing in the photograph. Uh, and the figurative de designs were drawn onto the paper. And then in both cases, the paper was cut up into the templates, either along the fold lines or along the drawn lines. Before the paper squares were cut, the design was noted on the square and lining up marks were drawn across the joins. And notation marks were joined so that when the needlewoman joined the pieces together, she knew which bit went with which. So you can see here, can you see these lining up marks that go across the paper? So she knew she'd line them up. And there she's actually got symbols to know that that line went against the line there. With the more complicated designs, um, the paper before it was cut up, she actually drew grids of lines and circles. Can you see the grid round it drawn and the circle so that every piece, and it's very complicated, this one, even those little buttons of the flowers, you can be lining it up so you know exactly where it's going. And there's another clue to show us that you could tell how the entire coverlet was made, has planned it. I've mentioned already that it has a vertical symmetry, but also by looking at one of the examples, you can see that the maker worked out which block she wanted to put next to which before she actually started constructing it. So can you see at the top, the flower block, there's a lining up mark that goes right across into the adjacent block. And these are the blocks down below. So she designed, designed it knowing that she wanted to put these two blocks together and where she wanted to put them into the coverlet. We've also got uh, examples showing that when she was designing, she created draft designs which she actually ignored. So can you see the lady block on the left and on the right? Originally, she gave the lady a very pinny head, tiny head and a neck and very narrow shoulders and a very narrow skirt. And looked at that and obviously realized that um, A, it would look very mean lady design within the block, but also realized that it was going to be extremely difficult to create and piece. To actually have fabric wrapped over with seam allowances around that neck would have been in, even impossible to do. So she's actually redrafted the whole design before she created the design she used. And this illustrates that this is somebody who wasn't doing this in a hurry. This was a woman who had leisure. This was a hobby of hers, not a necessity. And she was willing to create the designs and alter them until she had what she was happy with. Now, what do we know about the maker of the coverlet and the significance of the symbols EH? The initials EH also appear on the linen which backs the coverlet. The coverlet comes from a farming family in Wiltshire, England, and has been in the family for a long time. Family history research is not being able to confirm who EH was. And we don't know whether the letters relate to two people, an Elizabeth and a Henry or something, the maker or even the husband of a maker. Because at that time, it was traditional that a woman marked her household linen, but she used her husband's initial rather than her own to mark the linen. What we can say from the coverlet is that the, the owners were from wealthy stock and a level of society, often at that call, time called polite society or the middling sort. And that was the level of society made up of gentry landowners, merchants, industrialists, and professionals. The kinds of silk used in it are not the highest aristocratic quality. They were more the kind of silks that the polite society middling sort would have used. Now, I hope you've seen from my description of designing and constructing mosaic patchwork that this was not something that was done in a hurry. It was time consuming and it required needlework skills to the highest degree.
And also, in this case, the maker had access to paper, which is a valuable commodity in its own right. And also, the maker could afford to leave that paper in the covelet rather than having to recycle it again for another reason. She was patient enough to mark the templates when she was constructing it, and she was patient enough to give time to redrafting the designs. Certainly, I would suggest this was not the first patchwork she'd made, and she was certainly very confident in her technique. In order to discover more about the covelet, we made a decision to make a replica. And this is the replica kit on the left-hand side. Um, a soft paper like was used in the original covert, linen thread that was the sewing thread at the time, and a variety of silks. And the decision was made to try to conform to what the colors in the covert were originally. Um, and usually you could tell by looking if it was a faded silk in the turnings to see how bright the color was at first. And obviously, because black had disintegrated badly in the original coverlet, there's going to be far more black looking at you because we use the black as it was seen. And you can see there two of the um, reproduced blocks. And though there are the reproduced blocks from the front and the back. And can you see from the flower at the top what a nightmare it is at the back? with all those seam turnings, and how do you cope with all that spare seam allowance there? Um, and the person who made this was sensible enough to number the, the um, pieces. And I can tell you that during this whole practice, a number of the willing volunteers, willing volunteers, who um, <laughs> made pieces, actually made mistakes and joined the wrong piece to the wrong piece and ended up with diamond shapes and rectangular shapes and everything but squares. And some of them got sent back. Uh, in fact, one was sent back anonymously. Um, the woman had obviously lost um, interest and despaired of it, so she just didn't even send a na note. She just put it back in the envelope and mailed it back. And that is showing you the original blocks there and um, the replica block down below. And the person who organized this uh, found it very difficult to find patterned silk that w conformed. So she actually um, printed that using the bubble jet um, method, bubble jet set, Pr had to print stripes and patterns on to get the texture and pattern seen in the original. Um, and that is the original date. Now, four and a half inches square, you realize how wide those letters are and numbers and the task involved. And that is the finished piece, much brighter. But what did we learn from that? We learned a lot about how the original maker made the coverlet, but we also learned that modern women's sewing skills are not up to the task. Um, there were certain blocks where people wimped out and ended up doing a little bit of um, subversive applique to cope. <laughs> and in fact, the organizer had to say, yes, if you can't finish the block any other way, do applique it. Um, so I hope it shows you how clever the person was and how this mosaic patchwork technique is just stunning the way it is applied in the past. Now, having discovered this um, coverlet in 2000, I then realized I needed to go back to uh, the textbooks that I had taken for granted in the past. But I also had to go and look at every other piece, surviving piece of early British patchwork and to try and learn more about 18th century patchwork. And, um, in the textbooks is the second oldest dated patchwork known in the world in the McCord Museum of Canadian Life in Montreal in Canada. But it features in my talk because it's known that this piece was brought over from settler, by settlers from Norwich in England. And so this does fit in with um, my talk today. And the thing I think you will notice here is, although this is a much simpler design, the extensive use of the triangular shape and again the use of the shape where you quarter diagonally a block 
and you have colors which are tonally usually different, dark and light, facing each other. Um, and it's a pattern that when blocks were named in newspapers and publications in the 19th and 20th century, it's a pattern that we'd know as broken dishes or hourglass or Yankee puzzle. But obviously, in, at this time, a name wouldn't have been given to a block. But for ease of um, describing, I will call this the hourglass block just for this talk. Um, but you can see that's appearing there. And can you relate it immediately to how the maker of the 1718 coverlet was diagonally dividing her blocks behind some of her figurative patterns? The triangle is certainly the most common shape see, seen in the surviving examples of silk patchwork from Britain at this time. Here's an example from the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And it's silks used um, for square on point um, designs, but also for the hourglass designs. And this is, has, instead of the figurative mosaic patchwork you saw in the 1718 coverlet, the same effect being achieved by using embroidery. And the maker of this either embroidered straight onto the silk, or she created what um, we call slips where you embroider a design onto a, a, a ground of linen. Or, and then when you finish the embroidery, you cut the slip out and then apply it onto the piece you want to use it for. And another example, again, ex with the exception of the center, which has this sort of medallion type shape, the entire coverlet is our glass shape pattern. And this has very, very sophisticated silks. A lot of the patterned brocades, flowered brocades, I mentioned earlier. So the silk in this coverlet from the 18th century is probably likely to be a little bit more high status than the 1718 silk patchwork coverlet. Now, I've shown you all these patchwork quilts and coverlets. But during the period represented by them in these last slides, there was a battle going on between European manufacturers of silks and wools and linens and importers of textiles from India who were bringing fabulous pieces of cloth, lengths of cloth and quilts through agents like um, the East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. And what they were bringing included cloth with these fabulous designs and very exotic looking patterns. Now, the Asian textile workers had perfected the methods of painting and printing patterns onto cotton. And they used a number of vegetable dyes, which European manufacturers knew about, uh, to produce these patterns of flowers and birds. But you can see how they captured the imagination. The popularity of the imported cotton chintzes threatened the livelihood of European textile manufacturers. And there was a period in the early 18th century called the Calico Crisis, where there was a battle between the manufacturers trying to stop the import of the cotton and the people who really desired to have it imported so they could buy it. We love fashion, don't we? We love something new. You can actually put yourself in the place of consumers at that time and see how they were drawn to wanting this. And there's nothing better than telling somebody you can't have it to make somebody want it even more. <laughs> now, I do recommend to you a lecture you're very lucky to hear in May uh, at the center. Rosemary Krill will be coming to talk to you about Indian chintz. And it's an opportunity not to miss, because you will hear far more than I've given you this afternoon about the entire calico crisis. The earliest example of a patchwork using a patterned cloth, in other words, Indian chintzes, is the quilt from Levens Hall in Cumbria. And I'm sure you will have seen it in some of your textbooks. It's said to be dated 1708, um, but no written documentary evidence exists to prove that date, which is so precise it really should be somewhere written down. But even if we cannot say it was dated 1708, because there's no physical date in it, we can certainly say this is from the early part of the 18th century. And we can certainly say this is the first time that needlewomen, using the patchwork technique, grasped the idea of blending printed cloths together to make patterns. <laughs> 
What we can't tell is whether the quilt was made from brand new Indian chintzes or whether it was recycled from earlier maybe bed hangings or furnishings and put into the quilt when the bed hangings or furnishing got more worn. Now threatened by the import of Indian textiles that everybody wanted, despite the attempts at stopping the import, uh, the European textile manufacturers realized they would have to learn the techniques themselves and acquired gradually over the 18th century the skills to be able to dye and print cotton and linen. And by developing the European printing industry, they were able to compete with the Indian manufacturers. By 1780, the European and the British cotton and linen printing industry was well established, and this is the date where it's felt that cotton was taking over from silk to be used both for furnishing and for clothing, and that cotton of various standards of quality was available from the working class up to the upper class. And this is for only outer garments. Uh, cotton didn't take over the dominant cloth for undergarments and for bed linen until the 19th century. And it seems that people still preferred to have undergarments and bed linen made from linen because they wore much better than cotton did. Um, and these are two examples um, to show you the difference. On the left, you have a patterned silk. And by the 1780s, women were able to have a patterned printed cotton to give you the same look uh, of these large scale floral designs. And as soon as cotton was widely available to all levels of society, women grasped the idea of using the fabric to put in their patchwork. Now we as quilters are quite used to blending printed cloths, aren't we? It never crosses our mind that there's anything odd about putting 20 different printed patterns into a quilt and having them next to each other. Although we'd never dream of wearing different patterns, top and bottom. But it must have been quite an interesting thing for them to grasp, using patchwork for plain cloth like silk and then suddenly moving over to using printed cottons and blending them together to make a pleasing design. Now this is one of the earliest examples from the late part of the 18th century that shows um, the hourglass patterns, again, but no longer in silk. The person who made this has blended her printed cloths and used it to make the hourglass pattern so you have matching cloth top and bottom but in the same block the cloths the other side are embroidered with matching motifs and can you see that lovely dragon there dragon or lizard and lovely flowers as well sadly this uh, well sadly uh, because i'm somebody who's concerned about such an early piece this is hanging permanently on display in a college of further education and it's in the stairwell. And whenever I've been to see it, I've always made sure the light was switched off. Uh -huh. And you can know five minutes later, the light will be switched on by somebody else. But there's light streaming in on it, and it's framed behind glass. So I do worry about its future. Now, women took to the idea of using printed cloth for their patchwork. And at the end of the 18th century, patchwork that survives is distinguished by the large number of fabrics used in the cloth. And so I did a little test here. This is an area of patchwork which measures approximately three foot by two foot. And I counted the number of designs in that area. So that's six foot square foot, and there's over 120 different dress fabrics in it. And that means that would have been far more than a woman would have had her in her scrap bag at home, or even her stash at home, or the 18th century woman's version of a stash, which meant she must have gone outside the home to source the fabric, to find that many different designs. And certainly there are documents recording buying pieces from fabric, and there was a case in the Old Bailey Court where a man was accused of stealing over 40 pieces of cotton, printed cotton. And the judge said, why on earth would somebody want to steal these little pieces of printed cotton? 
And the accuser said, well, they have a value because they're sold in markets to use for patchwork. And on the basis of that accusation, the man was punished very heavily because the judge hadn't believed the cotton had got any value until he was told so. <laughs> so quilters amongst you who are frequenters of the Cosmic Cow and all the other local shops, you see, I know. <laughs> Sarah Dillo told me, and she's taken me there in the past. Um, if you feel guilty the next time you go and buy more for your stash, you can actually justify it to yourself by saying you are carrying on a 200-year-old tradition. <laughs> now, the method of piecing at the end of the 18th century, or one method of piecing, was exactly the same as the piecing we saw at the beginning of the 18th century. In other words, piecing over paper, mosaic patchwork style. And I've got a close-up of how the front hexagons would look. And can you see the fussy piecing involved? Uh, but also the back, that's how the back of the mosaic patchwork was used. And this piece was quite obviously made by somebody who could afford to fussy piece. In other words, she could afford to waste fabric and cut the area she wanted. But also she could afford to actually have those huge seam allowances at the back. Can you see? They're really, really deep seam allowances. And so this is showing you a kind of method of patchwork that was practiced by somebody with wealth in better circumstances and with times, time on her hands. Whereas the other method of doing patchwork we see at the end of the 18th century was seamed patchwork, where you actually place the two sides together and join them together with a sun running stitch. This is again partly hexagon, but seamed. And can you see? how narrow the seam allowances are. And can you see on the front of it, there's misprinted pieces of fabric. Can you see where it's, the printing hasn't gone all the way or it's been missed out? And some of them actually have written letters which indicates the end of the row. In other words, the woman who made this was taking scant seam allowances. She was being careful of how much fabric she used. She also was having to use cheap fabric that she bought cheaply because it was, couldn't be sold at full price because it had been badly printed. And this is another level of society that we don't often see records of. This is a level of society where the pieces made usually got worn to destruction, then got cut up for dusters or rags or whatever and then thrown away. This isn't the fabulous patchwork that has been saved in a big house uh, in uh, somebody who had a house big enough to keep things and treasure things from the future. This is a piece made by Anne Cartwright from Creswell in Staffordshire in 1796. And Anne Cartwright really wasn't very skillful. Can you see the center that her squares, which she seemed, are slightly misshapen? And she made an attempt to make a frame quilt, and this is a quilt, not a coverlet, what we call frame, you call medallion. Um, and she's got the idea in the center of having horizontal and vertical borders. And in the first row around the piece to squares, she actually has got those white corners. So she's got it there. But she soon gets lost, doesn't she? <laughs> and again, I think this is an indication of somebody who was doing things in a hurry, didn't have time to be very, very careful was aware that a patchwork quilt is something she wanted, and she was proud enough to have to put her name and her date and where she came from on it. But she certainly wasn't from the higher level of society. You feel that there's other things in her life that's taking a lot of her time, and she's hurrying doing this, and maybe she just wasn't that good a needle worker. Um, this is another example of seen patchwork from the end of the 18th century. Uh, a lot of very sophisticated fabrics in it, um, like this here, which would have been a very, very expensive dress fabric, a beautiful honeysuckle design. But here are some very basic fabrics that would have been lower down the social scale, working clothing or used for aprons and this kind of thing. And it was seamed, so you see that nothing really matches well. Points don't coincide. Well, there they do, but not always. So this is a very, very impressive frame 
quilt with the cut out corners for the four poster bed. But it was made in hurry using lower social scale printed fabrics as well as upper social scale. But alongside that Anne Cartwright piece with the failed frame design and the previous frame design, there are pieces like this surviving from the end of the 18th century. Again, I would say to you, if you saw those details on the right-hand side, you would make assumptions that they are applique, but this is entirely pieced using the mosaic patchwork technique. This is a coverlet that's obviously been used because it was finished and hemmed, but it still has all the paper in the back. The paper showing the guidelines of how it was sewn, um, paper saying up and down and numbered, showing how you could join this together. So if you would take this design and remove the stems, which were embroidered, behind the stems and the embroidery is a design of leaves and petals, the components to make the flowers that was drawn on a piece of paper and the whole thing was cut up to make the entire coverlet. And then the person who made this had the time to do in the embroidery as well. And remarkably, the embroidery of the stems and the embellishment, can you see that tiger lily? See the stamens there? All the embellishment was embroidered on the top surface of the fabric, but it doesn't go through the paper behind at all. So somebody was trying to get through the top fabric and the paper to actually do the embroidery. This is a related fragmentary coverlet that is related to the previous piece. Oh, sorry. The previous piece. Can you see in the middle the, the sunflower and the basket and the octagonal shape? That is related. Um, and I've been doing research on this at the moment. And that gives you, again, the detail, front and back, of how complex the mosaic piecing was. Even the butterfly on the top right was mosaic pieced. And you can see all the turnings behind. And these are representation of natural flowers. These aren't imaginary flowers. So this center basket has blue and purple sweet pea, which is the original garden sweet pea, uh, sunflowers, tulips, tiger lilies, and uh, moss roses with the butterfly as well. So Anne Cartwright might have been struggling for time, but the anonymous maker of this was doing this because she had other people doing the housework and the cooking. And she was in a society where she was expected to fill her, her leisure time, which was all her time, by artistic pastimes like sewing. And she chose to do this, something very creative. So I've taken you through the whole of the 18th century. I started showing you a figurative mosaic piece coverlet, the earliest known dated silk patchwork coverlet known in the world, 1718 coverlet, where um, there are some imaginary flowers, but some representations of real flowers, like those tulips. And at the end of the century, after the textile revolution, where silk was taking a backward step and cotton was taking over, you still have the same mosaic patchwork te technique showing flowers to show what was going on for 100 years in Britain. So I hope you enjoyed the 100 years sprint in an hour that I've given you. Um, and I hope you who've seen uh, British pieces of patchwork, which are just hexagons, understand that there's more to the technique than that. And that the early settlers from Britain were traveling to the United States with that technique in mind. And it's just very sad that um, the figurative designs like here were probably being made, but they sadly just haven't survived. So thank you very much. Thank you.